Behold, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. For Fanny Crosby. All right, anyway. Good morning. Uh, this is World Communion Sunday when uh, millions of folks all around the globe are going to celebrate Holy Communion in their own time zones as they gather for worship. So it's a, a day of unity among Christians around the world. We're glad that you're here. Now, I'm going to do something really dangerous. Somebody left a little package for me on the pulpit. And uh, it says, just in case. So I don't know if there's a life preserver in there or some emergency telephone. Or... Maple syrup. <laughs> wow, this is good. Look at this. Last week I was complaining that I had gone through the fast food uh, breakfast line and they forgot my maple syrup and I thought it was a crisis and international incident and the whole bit, you know. So thank you from Anonymous, I believe. So that's very nice. Thank you for doing that. And uh, that's the good stuff right there. So I'll have to find something else to complain about, I guess. <laughs> All right. Um, on a more serious note, I need to let you know that uh, COVID is not gone, and we've got a couple church members struggling with it at home, and I uh, want you just to be aware of that. Uh, the uh, signs on the door say that masks are optional, and that does remain, but don't feel um, shy if you want to wear a mask. Let's uh, be careful and be cautious. Get the vaccination. Um, it's still with us, sadly to say. Flowers, uh, Sharon, these are in honor of your sister's birthday, right? Oh, that's nice. Thank you for bringing those. We will have church school following uh, service, get a cup of coffee or what have you, and come up to the fireside room. The church school hour might get cut short a bit today because we have the crop walk and a, quite a few of us need to do some other things first. I know some folks who will provide transportation for friends need to help make sure folks get safely home before they go to the crop walk. So we may be cutting church school a little bit short today. Um, but join us in any regard and we'll talk about things. Um, ba bum this week, worship team will meet Tuesday on October 4th, 5 p.m. That's the group that helps plan the worship themes and so forth. And then Thursday, we'll have, we'll have both bell choir and choir, correct? Bell choir at 6, choir at 7 in the choir room. All righty. And the choir is with us again as they've gotten into the groove. Um, Becky was working in the office, reorganizing some materials, and, and she stumbled on a, a little pamphlet, and I was excited. It's a little booklet called The Character of a Methodist. This is a uh, modern-day reprint of something John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, wrote in 1742. So John Wesley, as this movement in England was getting going of the people who were called Methodists, he basically was sharing this to say, hey, these are the marks of our faith that I want to encourage folks to have. It's not just a doctrinal belief kind of pamphlet, as important as doctrine is, but it's a how you live your life. Please, you know, these should be our distinctive qualities. This is what we want the world to see about us. So I've got some of those. Uh, it's been reprinted. They've taken out some of the old, you know, these and thous and so forth from the 1700s, but this is uh, available. It's a short read, but a powerful um, reminder. 
So I'll have some of those following service today. Um, you and other folks in the community have been hustling for six years, right? Family fair receipts, we call them. And uh, when we bring those receipts from the grocery store from family fair, if we collect up to, or excuse me, let me get this right. When we collect $150,000 worth of groceries, the uh, store will rebate, if you will, $1,000 to the Action Ministries food pantry to help buy some food and supplies for folks who are in need. So um, Patsy Meacham has shared with me that recently we've hit our $150,000 goal for the seventh time, right? Woo! Which means another $1,000 is coming in for the pantry to help with supplies. And we're starting the eighth round, folks, so don't take your foot off the gas now. Um, you have how much? $10,000 maybe in groceries already? You realize seven times 150000 that's over a million dollars in groceries. Not just our church, but folks all throughout the Dwajak area have been pulling together. So uh, we appreciate it, and we're going to use it for the kingdom. Feed some folks, help some people out. Um, which reminds me, today is the crop walk. This is the heavenly high top. The shoe, the trophy that circulates. Last year we brought it home, and this year we want to hang on to it. So we will meet out at the Council on Aging uh, Walking Track and CAS 1.30 today for the registration, turn in envelopes and the money and so forth. They'll itemize it very carefully out there, tally, and then we start walking at 2, folks. So we'll, we'll keep you posted. Now, if we are able to bring it back home, we'll have a big celebration. If somebody else beats us, I'm promising in public to smile, be gracious, and say congratulations to whoever gets the award. And the outcome will be somebody else hustled at least as hard to serve the Lord, right? So I kid around about the shoe, but obviously we're all trying to, to give and serve so we can help people through the crop ministries around the world. Uh, I will notice, though, that Bonnie Lauderette did a nice job putting the uh, uh, First United Methodist Church 2021 and she reminded me that she left space. So we're prepared to put 2022 on there. So uh, folks who are walking, if you'd stand one last time, that would be great. All right. You see these folks? Uh, so uh, Sue and Jillian and Luann and Darlene, Floyd's up in the tech booth. Did I look past somebody else? Liz is walking, and Roberta's walking, and honey. I'm sorry, Nancy. I look right over you. Um, they're all walking, and please, if you have any inclination, I'm being serious now, um, give today. This is the uh, last opportunity to give checks, CWS slash CROP, CWS crop, uh, cash. No contributions too small. Everybody giving a little bit helps a lot. And we'll keep you informed and we'll find a way to say thank you again uh, after the event. So anything else, Brother Floyd? Anything else I need to say on it? Oh. And I, and I said that, and I reminded myself of something. Uh, I just got an email the other night that we're trying to show support for folks who are suffering in Ukraine, and I think they're asking us to wear yellow and blue today at the walk for walkers, if you have something yellow and blue to symbolize the folks in Ukraine, come walk with that. If not, come walk as you are. <laughs> All right? Uh, John Chilling has 
agreed to step into the leadership for October as our liturgist, so I thank you, John, for that. And uh, after we share a kind of wave of peace of Christ, um, I'll turn it over to Brother John to get us started. Yeah. Sir. Good morning. Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship? Today we gather around God's table from near and far. We are the people of God. Though we differ in language, custom, and tradition, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. For there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We are one in God's We are one, and together we remember our Lord Jesus. He gave himself up for us so we could be reconciled to God. Come, let us worship God for our salvation. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, O Worship the King, number 73 in your hymnal. You can follow along on the projection, and we'll be singing all four verses. seated and join me in the prayer for World Communion Sunday. We'll read this in unison. Today, God, we confess fumblings and failures in accomplishing unity as we set aside yet another day to remind ourselves of the task. On this World Communion Sunday, give us eyes to recognize your reflection in the eyes of Christians everywhere. Give us a mind to accept and celebrate our differences. Give us a heart big enough to love your children everywhere. We thank you for setting a table with space enough for all of us. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 58, verses nine, 6 through 9. Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them, 
and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Now we'll listen to some special music by the choir. Thank you, choir. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, 
and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Holy Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 1933. 1933 was a momentous year in world history. Not all of it good news. 1933 was the year that Adolf Hitler ascended to uh, unlimited power in Nazi Germany and a lot of other countries that were adopting Nazi-like uh, viewpoints were on the rise. But 1933 was also the year a Presbyterian pastor from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Shadyside Presbyterian Church, Reverend Hugh Thompson Kerr came up with an idea. He proposed that there be a Sunday set aside in a Christian calendar called World Wide Communion Sunday when all Christians around the globe would celebrate communion together, of course, in the rolling time zones and so forth. But over the course of that 24-hour period, wherever folks were living in all the continents where folks lived, they'd celebrate Holy Communion as part of their worship that day. Today is October 2nd, World Communion Sunday, 2022. But it all started in Pittsburgh in 19. 19- 
1933. One of the good things that came out of 1933. I don't know all of the details. Of course, I never met Dr. Kerr, but uh, I imagine in many ways this notion of worldwide communion or world communion was seen as a symbolism of unity and love for all people around the whole world at a time when that was not politically fashionable. It was a witness and a testimony against hate and exclusion and for the cross of Jesus Christ and the grace that is offered for each and all. Amen? That's the rest of the story. Why we have World Communion Sunday. And so today we celebrate a sense of fellowship with folks in Africa and Europe and South America, in Australia and other places. Wherever Christians are, we celebrate a kind of unity. But we're also making a greater statement, and that is a statement of value. That Jesus Christ loves each and every person. All are invited to the table, see? And though we have millions and millions of little tables today, it symbolizes the one table of God. You know, the kingdom of God in the parables of Jesus, it's talked about as a big table, a big party of sorts. Not the tawdry, cheap, destructive parties of our culture, but a sort of banquet, a festival, right? It's like the table to beat all tables with sumptuous provision for all in God's holy kingdom. We do a little bit of that today. We just have, you know, this is the taste. This is the taste. And someday we'll be able to celebrate the entree, if you will. World Communion Sunday. I want to look at the New Testament scriptures today in a little more depth. 2 Corinthians 2.9, John read it for us. And then Matthew 25.31.45. So first, the writing from Paul in 2 Corinthians. Secondly, of course, the words of Jesus uh, teaching about the kingdom of God, the end of history, if you will. See, Paul is writing to the folks in Corinth, Greece, uh, some folks say 2 Corinthians is simply a, the second letter. Others will say, well, he probably wrote several letters to these folks, and we have First and Second Corinthians. There might be some others that, that sadly we don't have with us anymore. But in 2 Corinthians 2.9, Paul is talking about God's provision for all people. See? He's talking about provision. What it means that the Lord will provide. I alluded to that last week, but he's talking about God's provision. Now, it's interesting if you look at the whole context of 2 Corinthians, and especially these few chapters around 8, 9, 10, what you get is he's talking about giving. <laughs> he's talking about giving. He's talking about giving freely and openly to love others, help others, Something this church really takes seriously. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. He's talking about that, and he's doing it in the context of God giving the overall provision. In other words, we're not just given out of our uh, simple means, though that's important. We're giving out of the abundance that God provides, see? And though we are charged to be responsible stewards... There is a never-ending fountain of provision from the Lord. That's what Paul is talking about here, that dynamic. And I love the Greek language here because Paul uses a word that, this is a little bit of a pun, it's a powerful word. And the word is dunamos, is the root word, it, um, dunate or whatever, these variations on this Greek word. It means the power. It's a powerful word about power. God has the power to provide. You with me? See? The power 
to provide. I remember I was in Nashville, Tennessee once with a group of pastors, and we were attending a meeting, and there was a gospel uh, band there, and they sang about God's power. It was, and, and I remember this. It's, I know a man from Galilee, you struggle in sin, he'll set you free. Two little fish, five loaves of bread, a multitude of people, my Bible said he fed, he's got that power, right? God has the power to provide, okay? That's what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 2.9. And God intends, here's the kicker, to provide through us. You with me? I'm not saying God can't have manna rain down again without us, or God can't do something. I'm not saying that. God provides in many ways. But one of the most important ways in which God provides for other folks is through us. With me? Through us. That's not some secular humanitarianism. That's a holy power working through us. We get to be a part of that, huh? How about it? And then Matthew 25. This is a, a story near the end of Matthew's gospel, really uh, just a few chapters before the end, and it's about judgment, Okay? Oftentimes we think of judgment as, sim you know, we say fire, brimstone, gloom, doom, this sort of stuff. And we have in our culture, even in Christian culture, we have this idea that on the one hand, some folks say, uh, oh, I don't like the judgy stuff or the judgment stuff, right? So we don't talk about judgment. On the other hand, some folks say, well, the Lord says it is tells it like it is, and, you know, you better straighten up, and there is judgment. So we have this, you know, back and forth that, oh, we don't want to talk about judgment. Or, oh, yeah, we do, and I'm going to tell you about it right now, and I'll tell it to you ten times every Sunday. Well, I've got news for all of us, myself included, there is going to be a judgment day, right? That's a United Methodist pastor who just said there's going to be a judgment day. Don't tell me I don't take judgment seriously. I do. All right? But the judgment is not going to be about little picky rules that we use against one another in that, quote, legalistic way. You know, we have the little rules. Oh, God's going to judge you if you don't do my understanding of this, that, and the other. The judgment is going to be whether or not we serve Jesus Christ through the power of God's love. Amen? Get ready for judgment day, folks. I'm not kidding. It's going to be about love. All right? This is the whole sheep and goats story. The goats aren't people who break a little petty rule of mine, you know, that this denomination says this, this denomination says that, I'm going to trip you up and you're going to be a goat and not a sheep. The goats are the folks who don't love. And it matters. Sheep love. Say, well, we're saved by grace, Pastor. I don't know that our works are going to get us in, so I'm not going to just go do good works to try to get into heaven. I get that. But show me somebody who understands saving grace, and I'll show you somebody who wants to love and serve. Amen? And if somebody says, well, I don't want to serve, I don't need to serve, here's my rationale for not serving, I wonder if they understand grace. Okay. We have the opportunity to serve and love by the power of God. Isn't that great? I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that, man. I don't want to sit around like I've been baptized in vinegar. 
I want to be a part of that giving, not because I got so much or you have so much or we're so great, but because God wants to do great things through us by his power. Hmm? Hmm, I love that. So in Matthew 25, 38, there will be a judgment day. Serving others is not a nice thing, a humanitarian thing. Oh, it might be all of that too. But it is primarily a holy thing. Amen? It's holy in the highest sense. And then the kicker for me on this one is God identifies with those in need. This isn't the human kind of identification, you know, where somebody's having a bad day, they had a flat tire, and, you know, I had a flat tire once, so I can identify with you. No. We're talking deep, substantial identification. In fact, it's a lot like communion when you think of it. When we meet folks in need, God is there. You get that? The folks who are ushered in, the sheep, if you will, note their humility. They're not in it for calculation to try to get something. They're just trying to love folks because God loved them. And they say, wait a second, man. When did we see you, Lord, in need, hunger, you know, hungry or thirsty or without a place to stay? Oh, you know, I mean, I love you, Lord, but I don't recall seeing you there. Hey, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. And for thousands of years, theologians have tried to soften the identification. Well, when we love those in need, it's sort of kind of like maybe a little bit as if we're uh, loving Jesus. No. He says, I was there and you did it for me. How about that? There's no willy wallow about it. You know, when we celebrate communion, we celebrate that Christ is with us in that moment. Now, he's with us all the time in various ways. But there's a special sense that Jesus Christ is with us. Christians have been arguing about that in communion for years. And, I, you know, we don't want to argue, especially today, World Communion Sunday. Some churches believe that there is a mystical way in which the bread and the bo- uh, juice or the bread and wine, whatever, is literally turned into the body and blood of Christ. United Methodists haven't really gone down that road. But you know something else? We don't claim that it's just a memorial. A lot of folks will say, what? I thought we didn't celebrate transubstantiation. That's the belief that it is literally changed into body and blood, even though it looks like a little piece of bread smashed down in his cardboard. <laughs> anyway, and, uh, you know, a little sip of juice. We don't follow the ideas of what's called transubstantiation, the literal change of the stuff. But we also do not teach that Christ is not there. You with me? Well, he's really not there, but we remember him. No. We claim Jesus Christ is with us in a mysterious way. I can't always explain it, you know, because... I'm not that smart. But I believe he's with us. Amen? Follow the liturgy and the prayers. He's with us. All right? It's like that with Matthew 25. I don't know how Jesus is there when I meet somebody in need, hungry, thirsty, out in the rain. I don't know how he's there, but I believe he's there. And Jesus tells us he's there. Amen? We need to take that seriously. There's going to be a judgment day, folks. I want to close with a story here. And I hope you will bear with me a little bit. But um, You've heard me use this language before. I say intrinsic worth. It's from old Dr. Asa Mahan. It's philosophy language. Intrinsic means it's a part of something. 
I might say God puts it there, right? And oftentimes we think of value. People, he said, have intrinsic worth. It's in them because God put it there. So people are sacred, we might say, right? God put dignity there, intrinsic worth. It goes along with Matthew 25. We might even say Jesus himself is there, okay? That's intrinsic worth. About two weeks after I was introduced to your staff parish relations committee in mid-April, is I think, of 2019, I attended my last public worship service at Adrian College. It was the graduation ceremony. It was what we call baccalaureate, right? It was the last worship service together on graduation day, May 5th, 2019. You folks were here getting prepared for transition from one pastor to another. I was over in Adrian saying goodbye. And I asked to be the preacher that day. Sometimes we pass it around to different faculty members. I said, I want it this year. I want to say some things before I leave. And so I was a preacher that year. Now at the baccalaureate service, it's a large chapel that seats about a thousand people. And we didn't have a thousand there that day, but probably 700 or so. And that includes, you know, 300 and some students, family, professors, administrators, everybody in this very big chapel. You know, it's very formal. We wear our academic regalia with funny hats and hoods and stuff like that. And we process and acquire sings beautifully and everything. And um, I preached for the last time at my college. 23 and a half years I was there and I preached to those students and their families. Well, what I didn't realize is they were pulling a fast one on me that day too. Because, I love this part of the story, the director of human resources at the college was sneaking around getting signatures on a gift for me. Now, I don't want to be rude, but people who are in human resources are sometimes cold fishes, policy wonks, rules of employment, personnel, right? If you're in that, don't, don't feel offended because I, I really learned a lot. The person leading this effort to sneak around and get a gift signed for me was the director of human resources. Very interesting. You see, if you look at the word human resources, I have friends that don't like it because it seems to, to treat people like they're just, you know, cogs in a machine. You're a resource, we're gonna marshal you and get our agenda done at the company, right? Human resources. People are so much more than that. They have what? Intrinsic worth. But on this day, Renee Burke was her name. She was out on the sidewalks and out behind the chapel and over in the, you know, the uh, gymnasium where the students were assembling. She was getting a bunch of signatures on something for me. She didn't get everybody who was present that day, but I really appreciate what she did, and I'm going to show it to you. And they took that wording and she said we had to run it through a computer graphic program to get some of the smudges off and everything else. And she put it in there and she got a bunch of signatures as a gift. And I didn't know until a few days later when she called me over to her office. But that was on the graduation day. Okay. That's not everybody who is there, but that's quite a few of them. All right, and they did it for me. I, I feel bad, a little self-conscious saying that, but I was so grateful. They got it, right? They got the message. They got the message of Matthew 25, right? 
And this is the director of human resources. Bless her. Bless her. I'm going to take it out into the narthex if anybody wants to look it over after worship. It's pure gift. Now, do you think that empowers me to go out and love those folks and others? You better believe it. See, the gift of God's power and love makes me want to serve, okay? It's not just an abstract, cold, philosophical idea. This is the nature of grace, gift, power. He's got that power, right? Today is about gathering with Christians from all around the world. And sisters and brothers, we worship a God together who invites each and every human being to the table. If that doesn't make you want to love and serve, I don't know what will. Amen. For our hymn of response. We'll be singing Let Us Break Bread Together, number 618 in the hymnal, and we'll be singing all three verses. I'll share a few of our uh, changing prayer updates uh, that reflect some of the good things and struggles folks are having. We want to keep in prayer. Um, obviously, there are more to pray about. I would invite you to keep uh, that bulletin, which has the, the list of other prayer needs, uh, some ongoing needs. Bob Deal, Sharon Harden's brother, is uh, continuing a struggle with cancer. Sharon's not here today. She's uh, um, okay, but has, you know, um, she has some hip and leg kind of struggles and is needing to stay home today. Uh, Richard Dar has had a tough time. Richard has had a series of some surgeries for 
a variety of illnesses, and, and by that I mean, um, you know, some um, infections in his, his extremities and some surgical procedures to try to get rid of the infections. And uh, talked to Rona last night, and Richard had surgery yesterday. He's doing okay, but it's been a long road, so we want to keep Richard in our prayers, please, along with Leon Lalen, who um, has had some blood pressure issues and some other things. Um, we do have two folks that I talked with, uh, one of them last night, who have come down with COVID in the last uh, two days, I guess. One is Ruth McDonald. Now, uh, Ruth lives in Forest Glen, and she has tested positive for COVID, but I'm told she's doing okay. Uh, she did go to the local hospital, I believe, yesterday afternoon, and um, they talked her into staying overnight just to get a little extra help and some hydration and some things. So I think she's doing fairly well, but we want to keep Ruth in our prayers. And uh, the other person I'll mention is Barb Groner, um, who has about the same time as Ruth and, you know, who knows where they were together or what have you. But uh, Barb is at home with COVID and doing pretty well. But trying to follow procedures, take care of herself, and respect others. So um, it's still with us, sadly. Now, um, one of the bigger um, items that's been on the mind of many, many people this past week was the hurricane. And uh, certainly want to keep folks, I, I know I'm going to forget some of the areas affected, but primarily Florida and I guess in the Carolinas as the storm hooked back around, um, so loss of life there, but also severe damage and, and folks struggling. We've had some of our members in the area. Linda Tabbert, uh, who moved a little bit ago, was in maybe not the exact uh, center point, but, but had some damage and, and is doing okay. She lets us know, but want to keep Linda and her family in our prayers. Uh, our daughters, um, Paige and Megan were pretty, pretty close and had some damage, but are doing okay. Um, and I'm sure others I know as well. I don't want to exclude anyone. Um, I will read a, a kind of update that I hope will give us a boost. Uh, this is from Tom and Mary Westgate. You know, Tom and Mary Westgate serve the Lord in a lot of ways, but also through the American Red Cross. And they are some of the folks that get deployed when stuff like this happens. They get asked to, uh, you know, get vehicle and supplies and head to the disaster zone to try to help. So Tom sent me an email yesterday, and, and I'll read it. Uh, Hello, Pastor Chris. Wednesday morning, Mary and I drove the Kalamazoo Emergency Response Vehicle to Orlando, arrived at 11 a.m. today, which might have been Friday. He may have written this Friday night. Loaded 2,600 meals ready to eat, MREs, the military style meals, and water, then drove to Fort Myers, arriving at 7 p.m. today, Friday. Bumper to bumper traffic from Orlando to Fort Myers. Power is out in this area, traffic lights, etc. We are going to stay at the Fort Myers Red Cross office tonight, evidently Friday evening, sleeping in the copy room. We should start feeding folks that may be cleaning up, repairing their homes tomorrow, Saturday, and we'll send some pictures when we can. Prayers for these people in Florida please. And that's for, from Tom and Mary Westgate. So let's keep Tom and Mary in our prayers, uh, as well as the folks who are struggling. I, you know, they're sleeping in a copy room at an office building. Um, so they're, they're, they're going through significant inconvenience themselves to love folks, and I admire that. We'll pray in a moment, and uh, we will save the Lord's Prayer, so to speak, for our communion liturgy, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for this beautiful, beautiful day, 
ask that you be with those who are in need. Help us to serve others in the power of your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now is the time to return some of what we've been given. The music Scott will be playing during the offertory is We Are One in the Spirit by Peter Schultes. The ushers will bring the offering forward during the doxology. Please stand for the doxology. Almighty and most merciful God, from you comes every good and perfect gift. We give you praise and thanks for all your mercies. Give us hearts to love and serve you, and enable us to show our thankfulness for all your goodness and mercy by giving up ourselves to your service. Amen. Please be seated. It's always a privilege for me to uh, share an invitation to the Lord's table. If you have not uh, celebrated with us, we are, for the time being, using the little packs. Uh, they can be a little tricky to pull back as far as the cellophane. We'll pull the little top piece back first, and that little bread will be the bread and the body, and then the uh, juice down below will be our wine, if you will, from the cup. Um, Becky always is very helpful in giving us a napkin. If something spills, you can use that and so forth. And just follow uh, my lead as far as when we eat and when we drink. 
um, it is such a privilege today, I, I say it all the time, but I love to say it, everyone's invited to participate. Uh, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, believed that Jesus Christ may speak to someone for the very first time in this sacrament. And so he was so uh, insistent that it be open for folks who have been to the table many times and those who are coming for the first time and celebration of God's power and grace. So y'all come. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven. We praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now in the confidence of the children of God, let's pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from you. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the gifts of God for all of his people, the people of God. Sisters and brothers in Christ, 
the body of Christ given for you. Feed on it and be thankful. The blood of Christ poured out for you. Please stand for our closing hymn. For the beauty of the earth, number 92 in the hymnal. We'll be singing verses one through four. now in the knowledge and love of God the Creator Almighty and the grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ and in the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.